This is the appointed time, and we have a quorum, so I call this meeting to order. Members, this is the first meeting of the Bills Committee. As you must have known, the House Committee has agreed that a subcommittee be set up on matters relating to Basic Law Article 23 legislation. So that after first reading of the Safeguarding National Security Bill, this subcommittee can be um, converted into a bills committee immediately to scrutinize this bill. Basic Law Article 23 legislation is the constitutional duty of the Hong Kong SAR. We have the mission of safeguarding national security, and both the executive and the legislature are responsible for completing the legislative exercise as soon as possible. The Safeguarding National Security Bill has been gazetted. Yesterday, the chief executive wrote to the president of the Legislative Council. In order to achieve the goal of completing the legislative exercise as soon as possible, the chief executive suggested that means such as convening a special meeting of the council and establishing a bills committee on the bill as quickly as possible um, be taken. It is necessary and it is also urgent to enact this piece of legislation. In light of majority support across all sectors of the community, the president of this council convened a special meeting this morning for the first and second reading of the bill. And I've also decided to hold two sessions this afternoon. The bills committee will work intensively on this matter so as to complete the scrutiny of the bill as early as possible so that we can complete legislation on Article 23 as early as possible for us to fulfill the mission of safeguarding national security and that we can focus on striving for economic growth and improving people's livelihood. That means we are going to hold long meetings and frequent ones and I believe that members will support this committee in fulfilling this important mission. Let's invite the administration to come in. Mrs. Regina Ip, did you raise your hand? Is the system ready? How about we wait for the administration to come in first? Let me welcome the administration, Secretary for Justice and his team, as well as the Secretary for Security and his team. Um, did someone raise their hand? Yes, Mrs. Regina Ape. Yes, first of all, let me welcome our officials to the meeting. Welcome to the first meeting of the Bills Committee. This is... Um, moment of history. I've been waiting for it for over 20 years. We had, had an attempt to legislate on Article 23 of the Basic Law back in 2003 to no avail. And indeed, we've spent so much effort in completing this exercise. For I, for one, would like to see this bill through as quickly as possible so that we can fulfill our constitutional duty to safeguard the security of the Hong Kong SAR. And we can also let the world know that this bill 
safeguards human rights, as there are many provisions in this bill on safeguarding human rights. After enacting safeguarding national security bill as well as updating the existing legislation, Hong Kong will be a safer place and that we can bolster our status as an international financial center, trade, shipping, aviation centers, so and so forth, and that we can all strive for economic growth. I thank uh, chairman for leading us uh, on this matter and uh, my party and myself will give full support to the work. Mr. Tung Nichae. Thank you, Chair. Well, as said by the administration, safeguarding national security is of utmost importance, and it is for us to complete Article 23 legislation as soon as possible. On behalf of G19 members, I'd like to say the following. We're going to do our level best to fulfill our duty and complete this exercise. And we will take a very, very uh, solemn and diligent approach in examining this bill so that this bill can resume its second reading in this council, followed by the third reading and its passage as soon as possible to better safeguard the security of the Hong Kong SAR. Only by then will we be able to focus on economic development. So we give full support to this bill. Thank you. Mr. Stanley Ng. Chairman, I fully agree with what you said just now. I am the only member of the FTU in this bill's committee. But let me say that the Federation of Trade Unions give full support to the work of the Bills Committee. Against the current backdrop of complex geopolitical interplay and that the U.S. has all along been trying to block us in our legislative work, we are facing such risks that we should not wait any longer. If we fail to complete this legislative exercise as soon as possible, the consequences and the risks will be dire. And that is why we should ignore all rhetorics. We should address all concerns. We should all focus on completing Article 23 legislation. We must not fail. Dr. Lloyd Park. Thank you, Chairman. Article 23 legislation has officially commenced its process after the bill received the first reading and second reading in the Council this morning. The Business Professional Alliance and myself feel honored as we are given this solemn duty to complete this exercise. So indeed, this is a moment to remember. I just received this bill today. Earlier, I reflected the views of the commerce and industrial sector during the consultation. Indeed, there is prevailing support from my sector. We are confident in the work of this council. For example, on the disclosure of state secrets, whether public interest can be used as a defense. We have had some discussions, and I see that you have done your best in incorporating our views to make certain adjustments. I really appreciate that, especially against uh, a very tight time frame. At this stage, I'd like to show my deep appreciation for all the officials 
However, we must not be complacent. There is a lot on our plate. We will do our level best. Mr. Tommy Zhang, thank you, Chairman. I am the only member from the Liberal Party in this bill's committee. On behalf of my party, I'd say that we support completing Article 23 legislation as soon as possible, as the chief executive said, so as to eliminate national security risks earlier. Apart from myself, my party members will also participate in uh, other areas relating to this bill. We will also reflect the views and concerns of different sectors to the administration so that we can formulate a legal framework on safeguarding national security and plug national security loopholes to open a new chapter. Uh, we give our full support. Next, Mr. Chen Siu Hong. Thank you, Chairman. Hong Kong people have waited for 26 years. We've had some detours, especially we had this painful experience of the Hong Kong version of the color revolution in 2019. Now, this long-awaited bill has been tabled in the Council. Together with members of the C15, we fully support the enactment of the legislation so as to fulfill the constitutional duty. Members of the public and my party or our alliance are keenly looking forward to completing the legislative exercise as early as possible. And together with Mr. Kitson Young of our group, we will diligently and do our level best in examining the bill so that the government can work full steam in establishing the legal system and enforcement mechanism for safeguarding national security. Mr. Jeffrey Lam, Chairman, first of all, I thank you for arranging this meeting in such a short period of time. This is an important day when this bill is tabled into the Council. It's been over 26 years since return of Hong Kong to the motherland, and since uh, our First time in 2003, there have been um, some twists and turns, and we've finally reached this stage. The government has spared no effort in conducting consultation, drawing up the bill, and tabling the bill into this council. I think this fully demonstrates the high efficiency of uh, the chief executive John Lee's team, and that uh, this is a team showing resolve and commitment and fortitude. I think that this bill is really accessible, and it comes with great clarity, especially on definitions of offenses, I believe that uh, the CNI sector will not be concerned about being inadvertently caught by the law. Our chairman, some issues have been raised in relation to the bill. I believe that there will be more in-depth discussions later. On the offenses uh, such as uh, one of espionage, treason, theft of state secrets, these offenses target a small number of ill-intended criminals. The purpose is to protect the majority uh, of the public, and we must be vigilant against any misleading or false statements. Because of geopolitics, I reckon that once We've started our work. Some foreign organizations, external forces will continue to try to smear us and disseminate rumors and false statements. The SEL government should continue to rebut such um, wrongful arguments. And uh, the government has done a very good job in this regard. In places such as US, UK, Singapore, they also have the relevant legis um national security laws, and they keep the laws up to date. 
to make sure that uh, they serve a great deterrent effect. So for anyone to pass any comment on the bill, they should first of all take a careful look of what it entails. They should also be objective and fair in comparing our bill with their own set of laws. One must not make arbitrary remarks. Is the Hong Kong ASAR's constitutional duty to implement Article 23 of the Basic Law? It is a necessary exercise, and we have dragged out this exercise for too long. There should not be any more uh, any delay. We will fully support the Hong Kong SAL government in completing this exercise as soon as possible. So, Chairman, I will fully support you as well, and I believe that uh, we will be holding frequent meetings. Now, Chairman, in fact, we can work seven days a week. We can even work at night if Chairman so indicates. All we want is for this bill to be passed as soon as possible. We still have a lot of things to do. We need to promote economic growth, for example, so I will support you. The last one to speak, Mr. Holden Chow. Thank you, Chairman. On behalf of the DAB, I'd like to say that we fully support the gazetto of the bill, first, second reading of the bill, as well as the work of the Bills Committee. Mr. Gary Chan, Dr. Kennedy Wong, and myself, the three members from my party, will also devote our full energy uh, into this matter so that we can plug national security loopholes as early as possible and focus on economic development. In fact, we see that uh, there is a great urgency to implement Article 23 of the Basic Law. For some foreign governments have smeared us. This is proof that we should act swiftly to plug national security loopholes. Some foreign governments are trying to smear us, but I'd like to invite them to take a clear look at their national laws. In fact, there is a common standard when it comes to national security. The national security laws in other places are equally stringent. The National Security Act of UK passed last year contained provisions relating to theft of state secrets, and the maximum penalty is life imprisonment. And about external interference, the maximum penalty is 14 years of imprisonment. In other words, other places also have similar, similarly harsh national security laws. Before they mount a smearing campaign, they should take a clear look at their own set of laws. All right, so let's start this meeting on the 8th of March. The Secretary for Justice and the Secretary for Security uh, issued a Legislative Council brief. SBG slash three slash one oh one slash twenty twenty four on safeguarding national security bill. This brief has been issued to members. I'd like to invite Mr. Paul Lam, Secretary for Justice, as well as Mr. PK Tang, Secretary for Security to speak, and then we will start the examination of the bill. <coughs> Secretary for Justice. Thank you, Chairman. I thank the members who spoke. First of all, on behalf of the SAR government, I thank the chairman and the Legislative Secretariat once again for arranging this meeting. This, mor this morning, the Safeguarding National Security Bill was gazetted, and then we proceeded to the first and second reading at the council meeting. And then in the same afternoon, we are starting this bill's committee meeting. This shows the legislature and the executive each doing its job. We're working together to make the our best effort to fulfill our constitutional duty of legislation for Article 2023. 20, 20, and then we spent six hours in meeting time over three days previously discussing the policy matters of this bill and also on the submissions we received. We will first brief members on the framework of the bill and then we will go into the clause by clause scrutiny. I want to stress five points. First, 
this bill will be local legislation, so we will stick to the drafting conventions of common law. First, where reasonable and practicable, we will have detailed and clear provisions. And second, for special terms, we will have detailed definitions. Three, for offenses, the criminal acts and intention are set out. The statutory defenses and conditions are also set out clearly. When an offense has an extraterritorial effect, the scope and target are also set out. And, far, and fifth, we will set out the maximum sentence without a minimum sentence for the offenses. As we stick to common law conventions, we also try to achieve complementarity and compatibility with the Hong Kong NSL, such as our Clause 96. It's about how this bill will interact with the national security law. Article 41. It says that the written consent from the Secretary for Justice is needed for prosecution. Article 42 of the NSL on bail, this will also apply to the offenses under this bill. Clause 2 of this bill sets out three basic principles. First, respect and protection of human rights. The preamble also sets out that one legislative object is to safeguard the lawful rights of Hong Kong SAR residents to ensure legal lawful protection for Hong Kong SAR, ensure the prosperity and stability of Hong Kong, the basic law and the rights and freedoms under the two international covenants that apply to Hong Kong are not absolute. Based on grounds of national security, those rights and freedoms can be subject to lawful restriction. And Article 22, and the Clause 2 also states that the provisions in this bill cannot contravene the basic law. We have had due regard to the freedoms and rights to ensure there are no unreasonable restrictions. This bill is fully in line with the international standards on human rights. The fourth point is that we have looked at the overseas legislation and practices. On the extraterritorial effects, enforcement powers, we have made reference to the relevant laws of other common law jurisdictions. We are not replicating everything from overseas. We have considered actual conditions in Hong Kong, and then we learn from overseas experience to draft a bill that works for Hong Kong. Many provisions here are not new. We are improving existing common law provisions or updating provisions that are no longer up to date. This bill will be flexible and effective. After the bill's committee scrutiny, we will be able to plug the last loophole in Hong Kong's national security. And then we will have a solid foundation to keep our country safe. And then we will be able to focus on development and deliver well-being for people. I now give the floor to the Secretary for Security. SOS, please. Chairman, members, the, prof the proposal is set out in greater detail in paragraphs 10 to 70 of the Legislative Council brief. I want to highlight a few points. The bill defines the offenses and also sets out the statutory defenses based on criminal law and the common law. Criminal intention has to be proved before conviction can be secured. This means innocent people will not be caught. Now, the proposal sets out various offenses. There are penalties for certain offenses. We propose to increase the penalties and on criminal elements and also the extraterritorial effects, members can refer to Annex E of the alleged code brief. Third, on the extraterritorial effect, to ensure the extraterritorial effects of the offenses are proportionate and the effects are necessary and proportionate. We have looked at the effects in detail. The detailed considerations are also set out in Annex D to the electrical brief. Now, on enforcement powers, court procedures, and improving other legal systems and enforcement mechanisms to safeguard national security, we have given due and careful consideration to the matter before devising the proposal. And it sets out the restrictions and the approval authority. We have also prepared 
a document on the relationship between safeguarding national security and protecting human rights. And that's Annex F to the Legal Brief. These points show that our bill is completely insistent with human rights protections under the basic law. We will fully cooperate with the Bills Committee to complete the scrutiny as soon as we can. Madam Chairman, with your permission, I would now invite my colleague, Mrs. Papalonia Liu from the Security Bureau to walk us through the bill. Thank you, Chairman. We will get into the clause by clause scrutiny. So here, I will not go into the detail at this point. But I want to give members an overall view of the layout of the bill. As the S4S also referred to, there are a few documents, and we may refer to those documents. So that's how we will brief members on the bill. So for this bill, there is a preamble. This is not common in other bills. But then when it comes to key bills, we do have a preamble. For this safeguarding national security bill, we have a preamble, and I will discuss that in greater detail in a moment. Now on the main body of the bill, first part preliminary. As the SJ just discussed, the preliminary sets out the principles for the bill. On key terms, the preliminary provides the definition or interpretation, and that will apply to the subsequent parts of the bill. Now I come to the offenses. From parts two to part six of the bill, we have many provisions to cover. So, in the logical brief, we set out the elements under each offense. Now, some offenses have an extraterritorial effect. So, towards the end of each offense, we discuss the extraterritorial effect. For ease of reference, members can refer to Annex D, because in Annex D, members can find first how the extraterritorial effect will work. There are a few principles we go by. And then for each group of offenses, we give an analysis and explain why a certain set of offenses carries a certain extraterritorial effect. When we get there in our discussion, I will go into the specifics. This bill covers a number of offenses. So we have a table, and that's Annex E. For each offense, the elements are there, maximum penalty and the extraterritorial effect or something you can see there. You have everything there at a glance. There are five parts to the offenses. We're improving existing provisions in some places, and in other areas, we are introducing new provisions. So the five parts contain include treason. This is an improvement on the existing provisions under the Crimes Ordinance. Most important of all, there are four offenses, treason. So we are making a change to the Chinese terminology. We're going from bun yik to bun guo. And then we also have treasonable offenses. We turn that into manifesting an intention or intent to commit an offense of treason. Under common law, there is an offense known as misprision of treason. 
we will turn this into a requirement on disclosure of commission by others of offense of treason. There's also the offense of unlawful drilling. We are broadening the scope of the offense to meet our need. The second group of offenses, insurrection, incitement to mutiny, incitement to disaffection and actions with a seditious intention. And that's in part three of the bill. New offenses include insurrection. This is a new offense. We also improve things, several existing offenses, incitement to disaffection, to mutiny, and also actions with a seditious intention. Now, in part four of the bill, we have another group of offenses, state secrets and espionage. For those two groups of offenses, they are fall under two divisions. First, state secrets. We will discuss in detail the definition of state secrets. There are three offenses, unlawful acquisition, unlawful possession, and unlawful disclosure. That's for state secrets. There are other offenses, unlawful disclosure of information that appears to be confidential. There will also be a statutory defense known as specified disclosure. I will go into greater detail when we get there. Now, Division 2 of Part 4, Espionage. We are improving existing provisions on espionage. And we will have a new provision updating the provision on prohibited places. There will be a new offense participating in or assisting external intelligence organizations or accepting advantages from such bodies. And now we we'll come to a new part, sabotage endangering national security. There are two offenses under this part, both in part five. First, sabotage endangering national security, doing acts endangering national security in relation to computers or electronic systems. Both are new offenses. Now we we'll come to the last part of offenses, external interference. There are two kinds of offenses. First, new offenses. And second, organizations engaging in activities endangering national security. We're updating the provisions under the society's ordinance, and then we move those to this new bill. Now that we have covered the offenses, we come to part seven to nine, broadly speaking. Part 7 to 9 are about improving the legal system enforcement mechanisms for safeguarding national security. Part 7. There are three groups of measures. Division 1, under Part 7. Enforcement powers and other matters in connection with investigation. We have made reference to the National Security Act 2023 of the United Kingdom. First, extension of detention when necessary. This will require an application to a magistrate. For an arrestee, we can impose restrictions on access to solicitors. And three, movement restriction orders. For someone on bail, when we see a national security risk, there will be measures for an officer to apply to the court to impose measures to minimize the national security risks. That's the first group of measures. The second group of measures, uh, for someone charged with national security offenses and th these people subsequently abscond, we want to have offenses to prevent and deter people from committing such offenses. So the Secretary for Security will be able to issue a Gazette notice for absconders who have fled for more than six months. This will become specified absconders. In such cases, the S4S, having regard to the situation, can take several measures, banning the provision of funds temporarily or revoking their professional 
qualifications and revoking business licenses and stripping these people of their directorships and revoking or canceling these people absconders passport. Apart from these measures, in some cases where needed, we propose empowering the S4S where warranted to engage in certain actions prohibited. I will go into detail in a moment. Now, the third group of measures, and that's subdivision four under part seven, and that has to do with the court procedures. Here, we're trying to target outdated measures or procedures or procedures prone to abuse. We want to streamline these procedures. We want to ensure fair trials. And we want to have cases scheduled as quickly as we can to deal with national security cases in a timely way. Now I turn to part eight. Mechanisms for safeguarding national security and relevant protections. These are broad measures. to improve the system for dealing with national security cases. So for public officers, we want them to provide assistance when it comes to national security cases. Under Article 47 of the NSL, the chief executive can issue a certificate on whether something amounts to state secrets. We are broadening the scope of this arrangement. Our proposal here is that even in the absence of a court trial, the CE can issue such a certificate. We will also introduce safeguards for personnel taking part in national security cases and those assisting with NS investigation. We want to protect them from harassment and doxing. This will help keep our country safe. Now we come to part nine. Many provisions can be found and they touch on a range of matters. These provisions include adaptations and necessary modifications to existing laws. The second kind of provisions under Part 9, we will make changes to three ordinances, Crimes Ordinance, Society's Ordinance, and the Official Secrets Ordinance. We will revise those three ordinances and take some of those provisions and put them under this bill. And we will have to make necessary changes to those three ordinances to make sure those three ordinances can continue to work. Now, I want to give some examples to give members an idea. I will go into the specifics when we get there in the clause by clause scrutiny. One measure is this. Now, someone serving sentence for an NS offense The commissioner on prison service, on correctional services, has to be satisfied that this person will no longer endanger national security before an early release. Now, we also propose to up amending the customs and excise ordinance so that the C and ED can also use their powers to deal with national security cases. So that's a broad overview of the bill. I hope that can assist members with the detailed examination. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Secretary, for your introduction. If it is agreed by members, we will first scrutinize the Chinese version of the bill. Upon completion of scrutinizing the Chinese version of the bill, I will invite the legal advisor to confirm whether the drafting of the Chinese and the English versions are appropriate. I refer members to the text of the bill. So please refer to the table as well as the markup copy. That is the Chinese version. That is LC paper number CP brackets 2, 284 slash 2024 bracket 01.
after explanation by the authority. Concerning the provisions of the bill, I will invite the legal advisor to bring to members' attention legal issues to pay attention to. Now, during the clause by clause scrutiny, you may press the request to speak button to raise questions to the authority. The comparison table has already grouped the provisions under different headings to facilitate scrutiny. I will first invite the bills committee members to ask questions. After the first round, I will invite other non-BC members to raise questions. Let's begin. I would also invite the authority to provide further information, including written responses to members' questions. I now open the floor. Which official will walk us through the provisions? Deputy Secretary. So we now come to part one, preamble and the preliminary. Let's begin from the preamble. We will follow the order set out on the comparison table. Now first, the long title and the preamble. So please refer us to the pagination of the Chinese version so that we can make cross-reference. Thank you, Chairman. So we now start the process. First, C-188. Sorry. Let's make use of the markup copy and the table of comparison. The bill comprises 15 parts. After we have scrutinized the all 15 parts, then the clause by clause process is completed. My apologies, Chairman. Please take your time. Page one of the markup copy, the long title and the preamble. The long title is To Improve the Law for Safeguarding National Security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China and to Provide for Related Matters. This is the enactment of legislation, enactments of Article 23. However, we need to ensure compatibility with the Hong Kong National Security Law and the 528 decision. That's why in the long title, we have set out the objective of the Article 23, that is to improve the law for safeguarding national security. In my presentation just now, I mentioned that there would be improvement measures on our enforcement system and our legal mechanism. So there are also amendments to that for that purpose. Now we have four BC members and one non-BC member who have raised their hands. Mr. Reverend Peter Kuhn. Reverend Peter Kuhn. Thank you, Chairman. Concerning the preamble, you have to ask question pertaining to what the Deputy Secretary has explained just now. We will move on to other parts later. So we are now at the long title, right? Yes, the long title just read out. I will wait for my turn then. Dr. Kennedy Wong. Chairman, my question is also related to the preamble. I have no question concerning the long title. So let's clear the names first. We are now engaging in clause by clause scrutiny. We have to wait for the official to walk us through the provision, and then we can ask questions. 
So concerning the long title as explained by the Deputy Secretary, is there any question? Mr. Stanley Ng, Chairman, in the long title it says this bill is to improve the law for safeguarding national security in Hong Kong and to provide for related matters. Should we change it to improvements to the legal system rather than a piece of law legislation? <coughs> we are at page one of the markup copy, that is the long title. Do you have any views or questions concerning the long title? So please confine your question to the long title only. So do you mean that the term law should be changed to legal system in the long title? Yes, that's what I think. We have the basic law and we have the national security law and also the new safeguarding national security ordinance. We have a complete system to safeguard national security. It is not it is more than just a piece of legislation. So maybe we should change it to a legal system. Administration Secretary, I invite the Deputy Secretary to answer. Chairman, I think it is just a matter of expression. In my presentation just now, we are very clear that um, we understand safeguarding national security is more than just a piece of legislation. With this new piece of ordinance, we will fulfill our duty under the 528 decision, the requirements under the basic law, as well as the Hong Kong national security law. After enactment of this bill, this will form a key component of the legal system in safeguarding national security, which comprises this new new bill, as well as the other legislation, other pieces of legislation mentioned just now. Together, they will form the legal system mentioned by Mr. Stanley Ng. So it seems to me that it is appropriate to use the term law. So why can't we add the word system or changes to legal system in the long title? Can we seek a reply from the um, drafting division? Thank you, Chairman. I thank Mr. Stanley Ng for his question. According to interpretation and general clauses ordinance, the term law is used. By law, we refer to legislation in exercise in Hong Kong, which are valid in the territory. The expression law includes other ordinances in force in Hong Kong, including the Hong Kong National Security Law. So by improving the law for safeguarding national security, Mr. Stanley Ng's point has already been covered, that is, the legal system. So are you saying that the term law include the meaning for legal system inherently? Mrs. Regina Ip, I don't think we should change it to legal system because law and legal system are very distinct things. Legal system is a system, and we are just scrutinizing a piece of legislation here. The law for safeguarding national security in Hong Kong includes Hong Kong NSL, as well as other ordinances under and acted under Hong Kong basic law. So it is unnecessary to change the term to legal system. Any other questions? If not, uh, Deputy Secretary, please move on. We now come to preamble. There are three parts under the preamble. Sorry. Reverend Peter Kuhn, what is your question related to?
preamble. Let's continue. There are three parts under the preamble. First, the objective, then the basis. Part three, and the obligations and duties of parties and bodies in Hong Kong. The objective of the bill. One, to resolutely, fully and faithfully implement the policy of one country, two systems, under which the people of Hong Kong administer Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy. Two, to establish and improve the legal system and enforcement mechanisms for the Hong Kong SAR to safeguard national security. And three, to prevent, suppress and punish acts and activities endangering national security in accordance with the law. To protect the lawful rights and interests of the residents of the Hong Kong SAR and other people in the Hong Kong SAR. To ensure the property and investments in the Hong Kong SAR are protected by the law. To maintain prosperity and stability of the Hong Kong SAR. The terms here are similar to those used under the Hong Kong NSL. In part C, that is point three, we have added the reference that is to ensure the property and investments in the Hong Kong SAR are protected by the law. We want to emphasize that the enactments of Article 23 will not pose any impacts on the business activities in Hong Kong. On preamble, please raise questions. Three members have pressed the button. Reverend Peter Kuhn. Thank you, Chairman. An important message in the preamble is, is this, so I invite the government to consider this. In 2019, we encountered the search of independence in Hong Kong. Now, in the preamble, it did not mention the sovereignty exercised by the central people's governments on Hong Kong. So we have to include that. Now it mentions to establish and improve the legal system and enforcement mechanisms. And also the legal system. The term legal system is mentioned in the preamble. According to my understanding, we are not changing our legal system. The legal system here is the common law system. So this sentence may lead to confusion. Deputy Secretary. Chairman, Reverend Peter Kuhn mentioned the terminologies in the preamble. As I mentioned, many of these terminologies exist under the Hong Kong NSL. During the drafting of the, both the Chinese and English versions, we have made sufficient reference to the Hong Kong NSL. The English version of the Hong Kong NSL is for reference only. So we think it is appropriate to adjust the English text to align it more with the Chinese version. That's why we have made certain adjustments to the English version. The spirit is based on the Chinese version, which is in turn based on the Hong Kong NSL. In terms of terminologies, we would like to align them with the national security law so that readers would not be confused why different terms are used for the same concept. The idea is to enhance the compatibility of both sets of legislation. What if the reader doesn't know Chi doesn't understand Chinese? Are we exposing ourselves to smearing that we are changing our legal system if people just read the English text? Secretary, allow me, Chairman. Paragraph B of the preamble to establish and improve the legal system and enforcement mechanism for the Hong Kong SAR to safeguard national security. That's the full title of the 528 decision. The Hong Kong SAR was tasked to establish and improve the legal system and enforcement mechanisms. So we can't take it out of context. 
The system here refers to the system for safeguarding national security. So the mechanism here refers to that. There is no worry that we are establishing a new legal system or mechanism. In English, it is to, to establish and improve the legal system and enforcement mechanism for the Hong Kong SAR to safeguard national security. We think it is very clear. Mr. Tong Nijie. Thank you, Chairman. I would like to follow up on paragraph B of the preamble as well. Establishing and improving the legal system and enforcement mechanisms for the Hong Kong SAR to safeguard national security. We appreciate that it is the full title of the 528 decision. Subject to the third reading of the bill, does it mean that we have completed our obligation, our constitutional obligation under Article 23 of the Basic Law, and that every duty and obligation under the 528 decision has been fulfilled? Or is it the case that we have to continue to uphold and fulfill these obligations and continuously? to improve and establish the legal system and enforcement mechanisms to safeguard national security. Allow me to explain the principle of Article 23. This is a unique constitutional obligation for us to complete. National security legislation has to keep abreast with time, so this is a continuous effort to ensure that our legislations are powerful enough to safeguard national security. When necessary, we have to review and enhance, improve the legislation. This is a never-ending work, but this is the first step to plug the gap. Deputy Secretary, anything to add? Mr. Tung, Mr. Lai Tung Kwok. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question concerning the preamble, in particular, Part C, line 2. It says, to protect the lawful rights and interests of the residents of the Hong Kong SAR and other people in the Hong Kong SAR. So I highlight the term other people. If you refer to the basic law, Article 23, there is a similar term. The term other people was also referred to. If you refer to the English text of the basic law, however, the term is other person rather than other people. So since the two provisions are so similar, would you consider aligning the two terms and fall back on the term used by the basic law? Deputy Secretary, I invite the colleagues from the drafting division to answer the question. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Lydon Kwok. The meaning of people and person are intercha is interchangeable. Grammatically speaking, they are the same. So whether we use people or person, the meaning means another person or another individual. So there is no need to follow the term used in the basic law. Of course, we consider Mr. Lighton Kwok's view. Any follow-up questions? My second question, please. Sorry, members. Just a reminder. I'll give each member four minutes for questions and answers. Thank you, Chairman. Now, in the English text, and I'm talking about long title and preamble. In the English text, I see that um, the Hong Kong SAR comes in the full form, and then in the preamble, it's HKSAR, the short form. That happens to subsequent provisions as well. 
I want to know uh, your rationale. Under what circumstances would you put Hong Kong Special Administrative Region? And what circumstances would you put Hong HKSAR? Because we see consistency in the basic law, whereas here, because of HKSAR, the short form being used in the Chinese text, I see the two Chinese characters being used, meaning only the special administrative region. In Article Two of the or sub, sub um, Article Two of uh, Article Four of the Basic Law. In fact, uh, it comes with a long form followed by an abbreviation referring to uh, Hong Kong permanent residents, and that's Article 24, Paragraph 2 of the Basic Law. The preamble is a paragraph of significance in the bill, so perhaps you should clean this up uh, for bet, uh, greater clarity. Deputy Secretary, thank you, Mr. Lai, for the question. As far as the structure of this paragraph is concerned, when we first make reference to the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, we provide the full form. And then because of this being a local legislation in Section 3 of the IGCO Interpretation of General Clauses Ordinance Cap 1, there is a reference to Hong Kong Special Administrative Region and the abbreviated form HKSAR. And the equivalent abbreviation in Chinese, the two Chinese characters. And that is how this is drafted here. Any other questions? Mrs. Regina Ip. Preamble, point C. I think other persons would be better than other people because other people is a collective noun. For other persons, uh, there is still this reference to individuals. So this is just a suggestion for the government. We should align this one with the basic law. Right. Um, would the administration please note this comment? Ms. Carmen Khan. May I ask the administration to explain the preamble? Is this a binding section of the bill? Because I understand that there is a definition of person in Cap 1, the IGCO. So why don't we first discuss this point? And that is whether the preamble constitutes part of the bill. Yes, whether it carries any binding effect. Uh, I will give the floor to the Law Drafting Division to explain uh, how preamble works in this bill. As explained by the Deputy Secretary, preamble is not a commonly used tool in other bills in our local laws. However, if there is a need to provide a background of this legislative exercise so that in future, if need be, um, it can facilitate interpretation of the purposes and objective of the bill, we will provide a preamble. And this is how it works. Yes, this is also my understanding. The preamble will help future interpretation of the clauses if need be. However, I would say that this is uh, for the purpose of uh, facilitating interpretation. Is it legally binding, however? Allow me to give my view. Now, preamble is not an operative part of the statute, but very often when we interpret a, sta a statute, we need to consider the background and the purpose. And if there is a need to interpret the statute, we want the court to be able to have a clear understanding of the background and the purpose of the bill so that we provide a full picture. So this is an aid to construction so, uh, so as to allow a better understanding of how the statute is to be construed. 
Right, so it's an interpretation tool. But right, it's not an operative part. Uh, I, I'm afraid I don't know the Chinese term. Right, not an operative clause or part. Ms. Carmen Can. Yes, I'd like the Department of Justice to explain the meaning of preamble to everyone. Now I understand it doesn't form an operative part of the bill. This is an aid to how this bill should be construed. So here, when we refer to the people, it's residents of the HKSAR and other people in the HKSAR. I personally find this acceptable. Whereas if we use the word person, then referring to the interpretation in Cap 1, a person could also mean an entity, a corporate, a body corporate, etc. Now, here the whole sentence is to protect the lawful rights and interests of the residents of the HSL and other people. And are we referring to natural persons as well as organizations? If organizations are to be included, then I think that the term should be changed to other persons. Otherwise, I'd say that uh, the paragraph as it stands is all right. Ms. Carmen Can's point is correct. In fact, person in Cap 1 refers to a legal corporate. So it also refers not only to a natural person, but a legal entity. So having considered members' views, we will consider whether, there a, uh, whether a technical uh, amendment should be moved. Other qu any other questions? Deputy Secretary, please continue. Right, second part of the preamble provides the basis of this bill. I think we covered those before. They include the basic law, in particular the provisions of Article 23 uh, and also the um, May 28th NPC decision, which is on safeguarding national security, the third basis, the Hong Kong national security law, and then the interpretation by the NPCSC of Article 14 and Article 47 of the Hong Kong NSL adopted on the 30th of December 2022. So I just mentioned four pieces of legislation. They form the backing of this bill we, and modeling on the concepts of these four pieces of legislation. We've drawn up this bill so that uh, there is high convergence with the uh, national security law. Dr. Loi Kwok. Having read this part, Chairman, I now have a better grasp of the wording used in the previous paragraph, and that is to say we should follow the NPC's May 28th decision. I just checked online. The same wording has been used. No other questions? Please continue, Deputy Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. Part three to the preamble, obligations. First of all, the executive, legislative, and judicial authorities of the HKSAR must effectively prevent, suppress, and punish acts and activities endangering national security, and second, Residents of the HKSAR must safeguard the sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity of the states. Any institution, organization, and individual in the HKSAR must 
abide by the law applicable for safeguarding national security, must, must not engage in acts and activities endangering national security, and must provide assistance in accordance with the law in response to a request made by the authorities when conducting the work on safeguarding national security in accordance with the law. You will see the same concepts throughout this bill. Apart from the offence provisions, as we mentioned in our introduction, for residents, public officers, civil servants, they also have certain obligations in safeguarding national security. And this is how it is spelled out here. We have a duty to safeguard national security. This is also in line with the requirements in the Hong Kong NSL. Mr. Tony Chair, thank you, Chairman. I support the three parts to the preamble. Now, I have a question. What happens if an amendment is necessary, for example, to effectively prevent, suppress, and impose punishment on so and so in accordance with the law? Then are there resource implications? Are there sufficient resources? Or should further action be taken after passage of the bill? Let me take this question. At this stage, the Hong Kong police force uh, has the uh, resources to enforce this bill. I have a question. Part B, you gave an explanation. I think that uh, this stems from the constitution of the People's Republic of China, Ra rather, Article 6 of the Hong Kong NSL. But it originates from the Constitution, right, when we talk about the uh, duty and obligations? Never mind. Chairman, if I may, your understanding is correct. The Constitution prescribes the obligations to safeguard national security. If my memory serves me right, it should be Article 50, 54. Uh, I've just been reminded by my colleagues. So that's true. Uh, there is, uh, I mean, um, this basis originates from the Constitution. Now, if there are no other questions, uh, Deputy Secretary. Right, we've just completed the preamble. We now move on to uh, preliminary. And that's page two of part one, and then short t preliminary short title. This ordinance may be cited as the Safeguarding National Security Ordinance. It's kind of a general description. It entails not only legislation on basic law article 23 it's also related to other relevant laws such as the hong kong nsl and that is why uh, this title is rather a general description called safeguarding national security ordinance Mr. Houghton Chow, I want to ask about the principles of this ordinance. Why don't you let the administration um, lead us through this first? Yes, we'll first invite the officials to explain the clause to us before we allow questions. Please go on. Yes. Right. Clause 2, principles of this ordinance. There are three principles. The highest principle of the policy of one country, two systems, is to safeguard national sovereignty, security, and development interests. Second, human rights are to be respected and protected. 
the rights and freedoms, including the freedoms of speech, of the press, and of publication, the freedoms of association, of assembly, and of procession, and of demonstration, enjoyed under the basic law, the provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the ICESC are as applied to Hong Kong SCR are to be protected in accordance to the, with the law. And then three, for acts and activities endangering national security, there must be adherence to active prevention in accordance with the principle of the rule of law and suppression punishment in accordance with the law. And then we provide the details. And accordingly, a person whose act constitutes an offence under the law is to be convicted and punished in accordance with the law. No one is to be convicted and punished for an act that does not constitute an offence under the law. And then second, a person is to be presumed innocent before the person is convicted by a judicial authority. Three, the right to defend and other rights in the legal action enjoyed in accordance with the law by a criminal suspect, defendants, and other participants in the action are to be protected. Four, a person who has already been finally convicted or acquitted of an offence in judicial proceedings is not to be tried or punished again for the same act. So these three... Provisions echo Articles 1, 4, and 5 of, 5 of the Hong Kong NSL. We provide expressly these provisions because we understand there is concern from the international community on human rights safeguards and whether cases will be handled in accordance with the law. We understand there are concerns. And to allay these concerns, we categorically spell it out as principles of this ordinance to reassure the public. Mr. Holden Chow. Two questions. First, on principles of this ordinance, my question is on Part C, presumption of innocence. Uh, the same act cannot be tried and punished twice. These are common law principles. Well, I stand to be corrected, but I have the feeling that uh, these are principles that we have all along been adhering to in our common law system. Is it your decision to deliberately spell them out here again in this bill? And then second, I think this relates to the preamble that we just went through, right to defend and right to uh, legal action. As I understand, there are principles against self-incrimination in the base. Uh, I mean, um, in the base in the common law system. We need to safeguard the existing legal system we practice at the moment. But in the preamble, uh, it is said that the resident or other people should also provide assistance to the authorities when conducting the work relating to national security. Then my understanding is it that um, preamb according to the preamble, to provide assistance in accordance with the law in response to a request made by the authorities so on and so forth, refers to an obligation, and yet this obligation is not in any way in conflict with the common law principles such as the ones against self-incriminating um, acts. Uh, Secretary for Justice. Mr. Holden Chow referred to the part in the preamble. This part actually reads, provide assistance in accordance with the law. So this is to be done in line with the law. So no inconsistency with the law. Now I come back to paragraph C under the principles. We are simply replicating Article 5 of the NSL. We are trying to achieve compatibility between this bill and the NSL. 
Article 4 of the NSL on human rights, rule of law, Article 5 of the NSL. Those two principles under the NSL, they are here again under this bill to reassure the public. When you compare the wording here and in the NSL, the wording is mostly the same. Mr. Stanium. Chairman, I missed something just then. Preamble. We had a short term, a short title. Safeguarding National Security Bill. Why call this the short title? Why call this the short title? Is there such a need to make this distinction? This is a solemn matter. This is usual practice. In the bill, you have a short title and a long title. Why call this a short title? This is the full name. Now, because when you state it in full, you have to state it. A law for safeguarding national security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China. But this bill is called the Safeguarding National Security Bill. I refer the member to the long title on the first page. The long title is longer. Let's get the officials to give us a response. The law draftsman, please. Chairman, you, you're right. This is from Rule 50 and 52 from the Rules of Procedure. For every bill, there has to be a short title. And that's the short title referred to by Mr. Stanley Ng. And the chairman also has a point. The long title is the first statement, the one about the law, a bill to improve the law for safeguarding national security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region for the, of the People's Republic of China and to provide for related matters. So there's a distinction between a long title and a short title. Reference Peter Kuhn. Just then, the government told us there's a need to state the principles, though the principles don't have to be explained every time. Why not put the principles as part of the preamble? Wouldn't that simplify matters? I'm just wondering that. So can the government get a, give us a response? Deputy Secretary or the law draftsman, who would take the question, please? Clause 2, the principles. There are many similar examples in local legislation. That's the objective of a particular ordinance. So the principles are distinct from the preamble because the principles are about the objectives of the ordinance, whereas the preamble sets out the context of the ordinance. So there is a distinction between the preamble and the principles. Any follow-up questions? Reference Kuhn. But there are many other principles at play. More than, there are more than just the principles set out under Clause 2. There are also other principles applicable to the ordinance. There are more principles at work than the few set out under Clause 2. Are these enough? Deputy Secretary. Chairman, let's be mindful of what we are dealing with in this bill. We are dealing with national security. So for this concept, there are offenses. There will be restrictions on, on the exercise of rights for some people and also deals with court procedures. When you look at the measures we deal with and you look at the principles, the principles are in line with what the bill deals with. So first, the highest principle of one country, two systems is to safeguard national security, security and development interests. This is what we mean by safeguarding national security. So this principle is in line with the scope of this bill. Now, protection of human rights and court procedures. This bill deals with offenses. For each offense, we have to ensure proportionality. When we think of the restrictions or impact on rights and freedoms, we have to ensure those restrictions are proportionate. 
I have also mentioned different measures under the bill. We have to ensure those measures are in line with the rule of law. And when it comes to trial procedures, we have to ensure those procedures are in line with the principles of the rule of law. Having considered everything, we believe these principles are consistent with the scope and content of this bill. Mr. Tony Tse, thank you, Chairman. So we have the principles and the preamble. Members also wondered whether there's a legal distinction between putting something in the preamble and in the principles. As we explained, the preamble is not part of the law. The preamble is not the operative part. But when I put something in the preliminary, that content will be part of the law and will carry legal force. The three principles under Clause 2 will have a bearing on protection for human rights and the operation of the future ordinance. And so that makes Clause 2 important. So we think it's right to put the principles under Clause 2. If there are no further questions, let's move on to Clause 3. Legal advisor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Just then, members discussed the principles under Clause 2, the mentioned Paragraph C in particular. Can we get the government to clarify a point? Roman numerals 1 to 4. Are these four principles all there are that apply in the bill? such as active prevention in accordance with the rule of law. Just then, a member mentioned the principle against self-incrimination. And legal professional privilege. So with these principles, self-incrimination, LPP, will all these be part of the principles of the bill, Secretary for Justice. Now, we're not being exhaustive in the part about the principles. We highlight several principles under Clause 2. The rule of law principles that apply here in this bill will be more than just those set out under Clause 2. Next question or next part. Deputy Secretary, we now come to the interpretation. There are terms that will come up throughout the bill, so we define and offer an interpretation of the terms. First, the central authorities. They mean the body of central power under the constitutional order established by the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, including but not limited to the National People's Congress of the People's Republic of China and its Standing Committee, the President of the People's Republic of China the Central People's Government of the People's Republic of China and the Central Military Commission of the People's Republic of China. Chairman, shall we address the terms one by one? Let's pause here to see if members have questions. Dr. Kennedy Wong. Thank you, Chairman. Where should the Ch Communist Party of China fit in here? Now, I'm a delegate to the National People's Congress. When we attend meetings in Beijing, there are decisions from the Central Committee of the CPC. So shouldn't central authorities also cover the Communist Party of China? Deputy Secretary, or would the S4S take the question? Deputy Secretary. If needed, my colleagues can supplement my response. In accordance with the Constitution, the CPC's leadership is the core feature of socialism with Chinese characteristics. All organs 
led by the CPC, a part of this system. So the term central authorities need to be understood in conjunction with the country's constitution. Any follow-up questions? Mr. Kitson Yang. Sorry, I was going to ask a question about external place. I will wait till we get there. So you can wait for the government's explanation before you press the button. Ms. Kamen Khan. Ms. Kamen Khan. Thank you, Chairman. To help us understand the term of central authorities, can we have a couple of examples to help us make sense of the term in context? So maybe an example about the provision in the bill. Deputy Secretary. Now for central authorities. Now under prohibited place, there is reference to the central authorities. On confidential matters, there is an explanation involving the central authorities. Can we have the page number, please? Chairman, I will jump in here. In several places in the bill, central authorities as a term comes up first on prohibited place. Marked up copy, page 38 to 39. The member was just asking for an example. So prohibited places refer to those belonging to the SAR or the central authorities. They are of a military nature or a work of defense arsenal. Now on state secrets, clause 28. A secret concerning the relationship between the central authorities and the HKSAR. Any follow-up questions? Please press the button if you wish to speak, Mr. Jeffrey Lam. Ms. Carmen Khan, any follow-up questions? No? Mr. Jeffrey Lam? Oh, it's actually my turn. Clause 3. Bracket 1, central authorities. It means the constitutional order established by the constitution of the PRC. The bodies of central power are covered, including but not limited to the central people's government of the PRC. The website of the CPG says the CPG covers the state council that covers the different offices, organs, agencies, divisions, units, minutes, commissions under the State Council. So to clarify, does the CPG in the bill cover all those agencies I mentioned? And that includes the directly such as Chinese Academy of Sciences, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Chinese Academy of Engineering, Xinhua News Agency, and the and the C and the China Media Group, and the China Meteorology Office, and the National Gov Gov Academy of Governance, and the Central Party School. So does the CPG here cover all those bodies, Mr. Luoli Mui? Thank you, Chairman. Now, here's my view. Chairman, your question refers to a number of agencies, bodies under the Central People's Government. We have to look at the context and the matter being dealt with. 
So this means let's look at our country's constitution. The Central People's Government covers the State Council, and the State Council oversees all those bodies and agencies you mentioned. In the Constitution, there is the Constitution of the State Council. It has a small constitution, but the focus lies elsewhere. Central authorities here, as a term, we give the CPG as an example. We say including but not limited to the four central bodies. Central authorities, as a term, means the body of central power under the constitutional order. Body of central power can cover all those units under the central people's government mentioned by the chairman. So we don't have to worry too much about what's covered by the CPG. The definition here, the interpretation here can cover the bodies the chairman brought up. Thank you. Mr. Stanim. Chairman. Dr. Kennedy Wong raised a valid question and that warrants our attention. As the Deputy Secretary said, the defining feature of socialism with Chinese characteristics is the leadership under of the Communist Party of China. The leadership of the party is of paramount importance. Sometimes we talk about the Central Committee of the CPC, sometimes we talk about the Central Authorities. So when we refer to something along the lines of central authorities, it's hard to tell whether it's about the central committee of the CPC or the central authorities. So shouldn't we take the chance to clarify the matter here? And shouldn't we take the advice of Dr. Kennedy Wong by including the central committee of the CPC in this part of the interpretation? So that's the member's comment. Any response? No? Can we get a written response to Mr. M's question after the meeting? Dr. Kennedy Wong. Sorry, Mr. Jeffrey Lam. For terms, common terms like central authorities, we see these terms come up fairly often in the basic law. The definition is already there in the Constitution. Do we have to spell everything out in granular detail and go to great lengths? As long as we have the common terms and they are in line with the constitution of our country, we are good to go. We, if we have to drill down for every term like this, then the scrutiny will take a long time. Simply put, for common terms, As long as the terms are consistent with the bill, then we're good to go. Reverend Peter Kuhn, we spent a good deal of time on this term for a reason. Central authorities as a term seldom comes up in our document. When I attend meetings in Beijing, they talk about the central authorities in the sense of the central committee of the CPC. Now here, I also see constitutional order. That should also include the CPC, but this is just my comment and for the government's consideration. According to my understanding, the body of central power comprises the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, the President, the Central People's Government, and the Military Committee. All these organs are led by the central authorities, if my understanding is correct. So naturally, it includes the 
Communist Party of China. So I invite you to take another look at it, and uh, we wait for we will wait for your written response. Any other views or questions? Let's continue, Deputy Secretary. The next term is Chinese Armed Force. Chinese Armed Force means an armed force of China. That is the Chinese People's Liberation Army, the Chinese People's Armed Police Force, or the militia. In coming to that definition, we have made reference to Cap 22 of the National Defense Law of China. Any questions? Please continue. Next judicial officer means a, a judicial officer holding a judicial office specified in Schedule 1 to the Judicial Officers Recommendation Commission Ordinance Cap 92, or b, a judicial officer appointed by the Chief Justice. The term covers all judicial officers and judges. Mrs. Regina Ip. I thought after central authorities, Chinese armed force would come to the term court. Why are we at judicial officer now? I thought we were following the alphabetical order. In the Chinese version, after Chinese armed force, it comes judicial officer. We are scrutinizing the Chinese version of the bill. Sorry, I have no question. I have a question pertaining to the definition of court. So this is where we are now, court. Thank you. Court means any of the following courts or tribunals of the judiciary of the Hong Kong SAR. The Court of Final Appeal, the Court of Appeal, the Court of First Instance, the Competition Tribunal, the District Court, the Magistrates Court, the Lands Tribunal, the Labour Tribunal, the Small Claims Tribunal, the Obscene Articles Tribunal, and the Coroner's Court. Mrs. Regina Ip, BC member. If this is an exhaustive list, you have missed out an important organ that is inside the trading tribunal. That is very important in financial matters. I wonder if you have missed out any other organs. You have competition tribunal, but you have missed out inside the trading tribunal. Is that a deliberate omission? Is there any other organ being left out? If it is not an exhaustive list, you should have mentioned, including but not limited to. Mr. Mui. Thank you, Mrs. Regina Ip, for your question. The Insider Dealing Tribunal and another tribunal for that matter, that is Market Misconduct Tribunal, they do not form the official components of the judiciary. These are just tribunals set up under the relevant ordinances to deal with market misconduct. The definition of court in the bill refers to the courts within the judiciary system. So in response to Mrs. Regina Ip's question, that's my answer. Understood. Please continue. Next term, designated judge. In relation to a court, means a judicial officer designated among the judicial officers of the court under Article 44 of the Hong Kong National Security Law. All the offences under the bill are in relation to endangering national security. According to the Hong Kong NSL, all such offences must be heard by national security judges. So to facilitate 
understanding of the bill, we have provided for the definition of designated judge. Dr. Kennedy Wong, thank you, Chairman. I would like to know why the term designated judge has been singled out rather than subsumed under the term judicial officers under a subheading. Actually, all judges are judicial officers. Deputy Secretary, within the national security law mechanism, the chief executive may designate a judge at any level of court as a designated judge. So the umbrella term is judicial officer. Then among the judicial officers, the chief executive may designate appropriate judges as designated judges. So we think it is appropriate to separate to separately define these two terms to make distinct the different positionings of these judges under the system. I don't quite follow. Supposedly, all the designated judge, judges were recommended by the chief or appointed by the Judicial Appointment Committee and the Chief Justice. Law Drafting Division. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy Wong. We assign a separate definition for designated judge because in Clause 97, it sets out all national security cases must be heard or trialed by designated judges rather than ordinary judicial officers. That's why we have assigned a separate definition for the term designated judge. Dr. Lo Wai Kwok, thank you. The government explained why only these courts and tribunals are included under the definition court because they are courts or tribunals within the judiciary system. Well, I think you should reserve some flexibility in the future, there may be a new tribunal within the judiciary. So if that's, if you allow for some flexibility here, you will not have to amend the law again. Well, it seems that this is a policy matter. Deputy Secretary, we will review whether we should make adjustments to the provision to allow for some flexibility. Shouldn't you re reserve some flexibility in case there is a new tribunal established within the judiciary? Well, if that's the case, we will have to make it clear with a legislative amendment. We need to include a new name and a new function of the tribunal or court in the definition, and we may have to amend the law. So the secretary means that they will do it by way of legislative amendments. Yes, because I don't think that would be a common occurrence. What about tribunal? That will also be done by way of a legislative amendment. Any other questions? Then, Deputy Secretary, please continue. Next, Hong Kong National Security Law. It means the law of the People's Republic of China on safeguarding national security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, as applied in the Hong Kong SAR under the promulgation of National Law 2020. This term will come into play later on, so we are defining it. Please continue. Thank you. Next, international organization. It means A. An organization, the members of which the members of which include one or more countries, regions or places, or entities entrusted with functions by any country, region or place. Or an organization established by or under a treaty 
convention or agreement made by two or more countries, regions or places, and includes an institution, however described, under the organization. There are two categories of international organizations under the term. The first category refers to organizations set up jointly by various countries for the same purpose. The second group refers to organizations established under a treaty or convention or agreement. Institution under the organization is also included. When we come to the term external forces, there will be more detailed definition explanation for that. Mr. Chen Xiu Hong. Thank you, Chairman. Some clarification concerning brackets A2 of international organization. It says entities entrusted with functions by any country, region or place. Does it include or exclude organizations directly subsidized or established by governments? These entities or companies may be established by certain governments for conducting for conducts of business. So when so in business dealing, our organizations, local organizations, may engage with these entities. Deputy Secretary, the definition is very broad. Entities entrusted with functions by any country, region or place. So the scenario you mentioned would be covered. However, we will not take any action simply because an organization falls within this category. The organization must have committed certain acts for us to for the relevant offenses to trigger. I think this is the concerns of many business bodies in Hong Kong. Of course, it comes to mens rea and actus rea when it comes to the actual offenses, but it would cause concern. The business dealing between a business organization and an entity established by governments with their own interest may give rise to an offense. So they would be extra cautious in these business dealings. So when we come to external influences or external interferences, I hope the government would give us some examples. So this is just a view. We will come to that when we are at that part. Mr. Lai Tung Kwok, the definition of international organization well, it seems that according to your definition, many of these organizations may not be established at a sovereign level. For example, an organization, the members of which include one or more countries, regions or places. So as long as an organization is established by a country, the definition would be invoked. And not just country, regions or places are also included. Say Aberdeen in Hong Kong, if a local body is established in Aberdeen, then any organization established anywhere can be counted as an international organization. So I think some clarification is due. Deputy Secretary, in coming up with the definition, we have achieved a balance. Of course, we can make the definition as narrow as possible. But if you look at the offenses or activities we seek to regulate, 
is that definition effective? On the other hand, we will not make the definition too broad. We are talking about organization with a bigger scale established by countries at a place. We have reserved sufficient flexibility under the term so that we can ensure that the targeted organizations would be caught in the net. If the definition is too narrow, narrowly defined, then some scenarios will not be covered. Some organizations operating under an umbrella brand may not be covered. So the definition here will cover organizations we seek to regulate to ensure national security while leaving the rest alone. So do you are you saying that the definition here has given consideration to other provisions as well? Mr. Lai Tong Kwok, you are talking about international organization. What you said just now refer to organization only. According to the definition, countries, regions or places, there is no international element. So I think the term is too broadly defined. I think Mr. Lai means Part A, an organization, the members of which include one or more countries, regions or places. So does that exclude the PRC? But we don't exclude that possibility. So the mem so the member organization can be established by our country as well. That's clearer. Huh? Thank you. So Mr. Lai Tung Kwok, when we come to the relevant parts, please raise your questions again. So the last member in this session, and then we will take a short break. Chairman, I understand the policy intent of the administration, but I think the drafting is very problematic. An organization, the members of which we include one country, so if it only includes one country, then it is not an international organization. So maybe you can define it as an international organization, the members of which include more than one country. That would be more appropriate. And the term region, we are very familiar with this term. We are the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, and we have the Macau SAR. But there is another term in the international context, territory. Guam and Puerto Rico, they are territories. They are not part of the United States. They are just territories. Many of them are also dependent territories. So I think you have left out territories. And the term place is too vague. What about Taiwan? Will Taiwan be covered? So why don't we copy the society's ordinance? There is a specific clause in relation to Taiwan. That would be much clearer. So I think you should have three categories, local organization, international organization, and organization in Taiwan. That's my question as well. Very briefly, can you give us an example? An example of an international organization involving one country or one region or one place. Give us a consolidated answer together with Mrs. Regina Ips. Hmm. Hey. Law drafting, division. I'd like to invite members to look at paragraph A. It reads, the member of which include 
one or more countries, regions or places. It doesn't really mean one or more countries, regions or places, but rather when I say one or more, it means one. Uh, it means more than one. So with this international organization, it means a country together with an entity as in Roman numeral two. So it doesn't mean that a member from a country, region or place can form an international organization. But I think that still this is ambiguous and this will be subject to challenge later on. It's hard to understand. Here it reads an organization, the members of which include one or more. And if you just simply say more than one country, then it's easy, easy to understand. Point B. An organization established by or under a treaty, so on and so forth, made by two or more countries, say uh, UNESCO under the United Nations. I think that uh, this is what uh, this provision targets. I find B all right, but for A, especially A1, I think if you leave out the word territory, it is not complete. Please note the comment. It's a drafting issue. Please go back and give it a thought. Yes, please, please do. Uh, we can, uh, you can give us a response when we reach that part. So the meeting for this session is now adjourned, and we'll start the second session ten minutes later in the same room.